I think it's fair to call this summer's initial anime lineup a tad underwhelming, but I also think most of us are perfectly okay with that, given how overwhelming both spring and winter proved to be with all their instant classic originals, masterful adaptations, revolutionary sequels, and transcendently triumphant examinations of the walrus condition. We'll be talking about the first half of this year in anime for at least the first half of this decade, and even with the break we've just been mercifully given, Given, most of us are going to be watching our way through that first half well into the second, if not into 2022. So I'm sorry, like really sorry for this, but uh, remember how there were three summer anime that didn't make the cut for ones to watch because they released too late in the season, and I promised to follow up if any of them were worth watching? Well, uh, it turns out they all are, depending on your tastes, and at least one of them could be an anime of the year contender, depending on how it escalates. So, yeah, I guess I'll get some sleep in October. Or, right, New Phoenix, right, no more heroes and psychonauts are out, so November! Whatever. For now, I suppose I should tell you more about these shows in greater depth than usual, since there's fewer than them, to help you decide if they're the shows for you. But first, I've also got to tell you about a great manga, because this Once to Watch Gaiden is sponsored by Mashal Magic and Muscle. The magic part refers to the setting, a world where everyone is born with magic powers, while the muscle is Mash, a boy with no magic who chose to chug protein shakes and get swole to compensate. This sounds similar to Black Clover, but unlike Asta, Mash isn't the only person in his world with no magic, he's just one of the only ones who hasn't been caught by the wizard Gestapo yet. Think of it more like that hairy fella's wizarding world if the Snake House frat boys made all the rules. But there is hope for change. All Mash has to do is attend a familiar-looking island castle school with familiar-looking robes, using his absurd brute strength to fake witchery and wizardcraft until he makes the top student rank of Divine Visionary, then use the political capital that comes with the title to make the world a scooch-less muggle -sidey. Along the way, he'll befriend a number of lovely, if a bit unhinged, classmates, and of course get involved in all sorts of dark magic shenanigans, most of which end with him socking some someone who really deserves it really, really hard. A thing that the exaggerated art style excels at depicting, along with dumbfounded reaction faces. If you're a fan of that one One Piece panel where Luffy clobbers Charlos, you're definitely going to want to read this. Also, if you enjoy One Piece's blend of action, adventure, and quality gag comedy, or that of OG Dragon Ball, Mashal strikes a similar tone. There's a link to buy Volume 1 down in the doobly-doo, or you can read it all on the Shonen Jump app for just two bucks a month. Speaking of things that mix comedy, action, and adventure, actually I want to save the best anime on this list for last, so let's dodge cancel out of that set and into The Great Jahi Will Not Be Defeated, a reverse isekai comedy about a mighty evil demon lord who's cast down into our world, stripped of all magic, after a humiliating defeat at the hands of a destined heroine, and must survive the even mightier evils of capitalism by working part-time at a restaurant. No, not that one. This restaurant's not a franchise, and it has Wii Shop Channel music. <laughs> Also, Jahi's not even a proper demon king, just the demon realm's second in command, and she's nowhere near as nice or managerial as good old Mao Sato. She's more of a, how to put this, vicious demonic sadist who likes to kill some of her servants at random just to keep the other ones on their toes. Which, when you take away the almighty magical power and social status that allowed her to act like that in the first place, leaves you with a hilariously arrogant trash goblin whose mouth is constantly writing checks her butt can't cash. Especially not when that butt keeps disappearing into an oversized t-shirt, as without mana she can't maintain her voluptuous true form and is stuck in the body of a tiny, ill-tempered chibi imp. It also doesn't help with the check side of the equation that her cash reserves usually number in the hundreds of yen. The Devil is a Part-Timer actually isn't the best point of comparison here, at least not as comedy anime go. Jahi's more reminiscent of Himoto Umaru-chan, only it actually explains how the shrinking works, all of the hello fellow gamer kids humor has been stripped out, and Onisan's personality is divvied up between a pair of Onechans. 
a busty Ara Ara restaurant owner with a nurturing personality to match her childbearing hips, and her leaner, meaner landlord sister who is constantly exasperated by the precocious goblin's indignant tantrums at the thought that the mighty Lord Jahi should ever pay rent to a lowly human which is a slightly difficult argument to make when said lowly human towers over you and can pick you up and evict you with literally one hand, but that never stops Jahi from trying. Luckily, the aforementioned Onesama's also aforementioned nurturing personality tends to win out over the both of them, keeping the great all-powerful demon off the streets while gently encouraging her to gradually grow and change into something resembling a responsible human adult. Very, very gradually. You don't unlearn being a demonic despot overnight. It doesn't help that her malignant narcissism is constantly being reinforced and simultaneously challenged by her sycophantic servant, Druge, who was Jahi's most faithful and masochistic underling in the Dark Realm, but has actually surpassed the Great One in our world as the fabulously wealthy founder and CEO of her own company, which she uses to gather mana crystals by the literal truckload while Jahi is busy subsisting on bean sprouts and mayonnaise. And that's on fancy nights. And while those may seem like two problems that obviously solve each other, that's only because you don't have a demon queen's ego. Jahi constantly lies and brags about how well she's doing, and because Druge is phenomenally gullible and worships the ground she walks on, she never catches on. Thus, Jahi's comical misery is endlessly perpetuated by her own comically misplaced arrogance, meaning that we don't have to feel bad for laughing at her. Though that wicked, schadenfreude-fueled sense of humor is consistently tempered by the series' kind, encouraging, Yashike-esque emotional core. Jahi will frequently do something stupid or careless and bring herself to tears, but Onesama's usually close at hand with a shoulder to cry on, or uh, shoulder boulders to cry in, as it were. That said, it is also worth noting that despite the designs, Jahi-sama isn't really all that horny, and thankfully it never eludes the chibi. Instead, it uses the sometimes diminutive, always adorably childish nature of its lead to externalize the feelings of inherent unfairness that many of us experience when our inner child is first exposed to the reality of being a minimum wage adult. Add all that together and you get a relatable, surprisingly feel-good work-life comedy with an occasional side of fun fantasy action and some real satirical bite. Though if you're a fan of those last two things, you will likely be better served by the Idaten deities know only piece where they're the main course. Despite the overlong title, this anime is based on a manga, not a light novel, specifically a seinen manga, so while its general tone and martial arts action will likely remind you of your favorite Shonen Jump punch-em-ups, that action is infused with substantially more violence and sex than anything this side of Chainsaw Man. The titular deities, the Idaten, are a race of conceptual beings that are literally born to fight, emerging from the subconscious ether whenever mankind's collective desire for salvation peaks, with shapes and personalities that vary wildly based on the aggregate thoughts that birthed them. The one consistency between all of these gods is an innate desire to kill demons, but as the last 2,000 or so of those were sealed away in a giant mountain 800 years ago by the elder generation of Idaten, Daten, leaving only one nervous young squire named Rin to watch the other side, all who've been born since know only well, I mean, it's right there in the title. As such, with only a couple of go-getting, combat-capable exceptions, the whole pantheon of new gods has grown up indolent and weak. They take advantage of their immortality and superhuman abilities to live in luxury, burying their noses in books and doing basically anything that isn't getting killed over and over by Rin to train up their healing factors. Which she does, you know, just in case the monsters that traumatized her and took away all of her family ever come back. Which obviously they do, or there wouldn't be a story, leaving the lazy gods scrambling for a way to fight back. Or failing that, a stronger god who can beat the demons up for them. Though even Rin's strength may not be enough. In the last 800 years, the demons have evolved, taking on human forms and with them human intelligence, which they use to manipulate men en masse to do their bidding in the form of a raping and pillaging fascist empire. 
on that note, big content warning. Episode one does end with a scene depicting those two verbs. It's not quite as explicit or exploitative as other anime that tackle the same topic, but it is still quite jarring next to the lighthearted action comedy that precedes it. That contrast does serve a purpose, though, in highlighting the disturbing indifference these gods feel toward even the most egregious human suffering. Idaten need a planet to live on, preferably with some intact nature to enjoy, and enough people to make more of them, but they don't particularly care which of the people stay alive. In fact, since our desire for salvation is what creates them, ignoring wars, atrocities, corruption, and exploitation is kind of a winning reproductive strategy. It is a truly alien, nigh incomprehensible system of morality, which goes a long way toward making these characters feel like real gods and demons, but leaves us without a relatable human character to anchor us in their world and conflict. Instead, we observe from a dispassionate distance, pretty much the same outlook all of them have, which does make it hard to get emotionally invested in the story, but simultaneously evokes a kind of chilling fascination that makes it just as hard to look away. It does help that what we're dispassionately observing is metaphysically fascinating. The lore regarding how demons and Idaten function, their biology or notable lack thereof, is dense, well thought out, and supports bombastic action set pieces that start at Dragon Ball Z levels and only escalate from there. These are battles of gods, after all. That action is made all the more enjoyable by smooth, snappy animation rendered in an arresting, psychedelic visual style that plays fast and loose with color and shading to give each scene a distinctive pop art mood. The simple, expressive character designs also contribute a great deal toward making the fights pop off, as do the characters' personalities, which, monstrous though many of them may be, are all at least as vibrant and charismatic as your favorite heel wrestler, making every second of trash talk a delight. Also, that art style makes for one of the single greatest anime openings I've ever seen. Idaten Deities definitely isn't for everyone, but if you enjoy a bit of the old ultraviolence, it may just be the anime for you. Fena Pirate Princess, on the other hand, is a show I can wholeheartedly recommend to anyone who might be interested. It's the Pirates vs. Ninjas anime we've all secretly dreamed of ever since the idea was first memed of in the Internet Dark Ages, produced at Production IG with the joint backing of Adult Swim and Crunchyroll, and directed by industry veteran Kazuto Nakamura. Nakazawa, who you might know as the creator of Be the Beginning, or if you were alive when the Pirate vs. Ninja meme was actually fresh, director of the anime segments in both Linkin Park's Breaking the Habit music video and Kill Bill Volume 1. That last point is particularly relevant here, as this is a dude with both a knack and a passion for making sword fights look awesome, and that's objectively the single most important thing for any anime on this topic to get right. Tone and atmosphere come a close second. You know, that specific cinematic feeling of high seas, high adventure in a bygone era that Pirates of the Caribbean captures so well. Fena captures it, too, in its soaring, whimsical score composed by the legendary Yuki Kajiura and in its lush, detailed, thoughtfully lit backgrounds populated by sizable, moving crowds of authentically costumed characters. There's a ton of animation flexes in the first episode alone, even in dialogue. It has a fluid, bouncy energy to it, and that stayed consistent through all four episodes that are out as of this writing. It's not the most historically faithful piece of pirate media out there. No story that injects ninjas into that setting would be, and these ninjas happen to own a steampunk submarine, but all the necessary details there in both the fantastical and historical elements to immerse you in the alt history setting and make it feel like it all fits together. As of episode 4, the story also seems to be going somewhere really interesting with these revisions, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I haven't even talked about Fena yet. The titular deposed princess has lived a rough life since a pirate raid killed her father and set her adrift in the open ocean, but she never lets it get her down. 
sure, she's been effectively enslaved by a brothel that's auctioned off her virginity now that she's of age, but even in the face of such overwhelming despair, she only smiles a spunky, defiant, genki smile and draws up elaborate, unrealistic escape plans in crayon. Luckily, there's people looking out for her who are a bit better prepared, namely a pair of old knights who swoop into her rescue at the last minute, and the aforementioned squad of ninja who swoop in to rescue them when that all goes to heck. And with those ninja protecting her, I mean, the show calls them the Samurai Seven, but they dress in all black and run on rooftops, so let's not split hairs. She sets out on a grand quest to discover her destiny, uncover the secrets of a mysterious clear stone that her father left to her, and learn what he really meant when he told her to find Eden. Also, if somewhere along the way in that quest she happened to end up smooching Yukimaru, her aloof, handsome childhood friend turned ninja knight in matte black armor, well, she probably wouldn't complain. He almost certainly would, but he wouldn't really mean it, and anyway, that's just part of his tsundere charm. All of the ninjas have their own charms, as do the ragtag crew of evil lady pirates that get sent to fight them. This cast is full of big, memorable personalities whose chemistry works in a wide array of configurations, giving us action scenes rich in playful banter and choreography, and plenty of quality comedy in between them. Fena, Pirate Princess, is simply put a joy to watch in every sense of the word, a real rip roar and adventure of a sort that feels all too rare nowadays in anime and media at large. It's not quite in anime of the year territory just yet, but the voyage has only just begun, and it's sailing closer and closer with each episode. Assuming it can keep this quality up to the season's end, and that its plot makes good on the intrigue and stakes that it's built up so far, this is shaping up to be a serious contender. And even if it doesn't reach those lofty heights, it is all but sure to be a fun ride. All of the shows I've talked about today are really fun, and again, I'm really sorry for that, but I can't just not tell people about good anime, now can I? Wait, can I? It's been so long since I've done anything different. Well, no time to think about that now. I've been writing all day, and I really want to play some Psychonauts. But I hope you've found at least one new anime to hold your attention today. Or manga. Mashal is seriously fantastic. Also, I'm sorry if you've found something new to hold your attention. Really, just so sorry. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Canadian, signing out from Psychonauts HQ.